welcome to chemistry. This is the beginning of a year of a flipped classroom. This is one where you will spend the time at home taking notes and then bring your notes into class so that you can use them to, you, to do fun and interesting projects in school. Instead of sitting at home at night trying to do homework questions, you will do some of those questions in school. I'll be there and walk around and help you so that your understanding of chemistry is the best that it can be. Sometimes you'll see my face, like today. Other days you might just hear my voice. But either way, you're going to get the same content as you would in a traditional classroom, but this time you're going to get everything you have in the evening. You can do it at midnight, you can do it right after school, you can do it during a free period, you can do it in your pajamas, you can do this flipped classroom anywhere. If you miss class for whatever reason, you're not really missing any important information. So I think it makes students feel a little bit more secure in their understanding of the basic concepts. The good thing about the flipped classroom is you can stop and you can pause me. You can rewind, listen again, listen to the whole thing before a test, make it work for you. And of course, I'm always here to help you. So let's get started. Let me find the forward button. Backward. So some of these concepts you already know from other science classes. And the good news is, for some of you, you know, you might not need to write too much down. Others of you might want to write everything that you see. The scientific method, we've been doing that probably since elementary school time. It's really a series of steps that helps us guide our inquiry. The first important thing is observation, of course, because we have to be able to observe the world around us to understand it. Sometimes that involves asking a question. So sometimes we observe the world and we ask ourselves a question. We wonder what it is. Then we make a hypothesis about that. That's an educated guess. Then we design an experiment. So we design an experiment to test our hypothesis. An experiment has a dependent and an independent variable, which we'll get to later. Um, and we manipulate the data, one facet of the data, so we can see any changes that might take place. Then, after many experiments, we develop a theory, and eventually it, it becomes a law. So those are just some, a very brief series of steps um, of the scientific method. Remember, you can look at the page references on the assignment sheet to see more information if you'd like to read it from your textbook. So let's look about, let's think about designing an experiment. The design of the experiment part is the question you are exploring and the educated guess that you're giving it. We have to think about what variables are you going to change in your experiment? How are we going to do that experiment? That's the kind of stuff I like to do in class. What variables are going to stay the same or remain constant in your experiment? Remember, you can only change one variable at a time. And then, of course, during the experiment, what are you going to be observing? And what are you going to measure? Scientists like to measure things and compare measurements from one experiment to the next to see if things are remaining constant or something's changing. How are you going to uh, record your data? And, you know, how are you going to um, present the data at the end? So, measuring. Measuring is an important part of what scientists do, and we have to make sure to measure correctly. There's some basic rules of measuring, using a ruler or a balance or a graduated cylinder or a beaker, whatever you're using to measure something, there's some basic rules, and here they are. We always measure to one more place than the instrument is marked. So if the instrument is marked to the ones place, and let me get my pen out. And here we go. So let's say we have an instrument and it's marked to the ones place. Think, think about your um, placeholders, as you were called back when you were learning math. This is the ones place right here. So if your instrument is marked to the ones place, so like, well, here's a graduated cylinder, and this is number five, 
and this is number six. And there are no lines in between. And then, you know, of course, you have some sort of liquid filling the container down below. You obviously want to read the meniscus, which is the bottom curve. How do you read that? This instrument is marked to the ones place. So I know it's at least five. That's for sure. But it's not yet to six. So what I have to do is figure out the uncertain digit. And that's what the next bullet point says. In a measurement, there's always one uncertain digit. That's the guess. So I'm going to guess 5.4. And that's the uncertain digit. In a reading, there's always one uncertain digit, and all the rest are certain. So I said 0.4 because I estimated between 5 and 6 that the bottom of the curve looks like it might be 4 tenths the way to number 6. Now some people might say, no, it looks like a 3, and other people might say it looks like a 5 at the end. So I said 5.4, but others might say 5.3 and still others might say 5.5. Of course, I think I'm right. But do you notice there's a certain amount of uncertainty here? There's a range of uncertainty. Because um, the 0.4 was an estimate on my part. So the reading is pretty good, but there is there could be source of error. But again, as a scientist, we want to reduce that source of error to zero. That would be the best case scenario. So that's how you measure an instrument. So let's practice reading some of these. The first four here are um, measurements of volume. And in fact, this, this one down here, the fourth one, I guess, I don't even see any liquid, so I'll have to make something up. And then the one over here is obviously measuring length in centimeters. So let's look at reading these. Now what you might want to do is um, pause the video now, r actually write your answers down, push play again, and then you'll hear what I came up with as the right answer. Okay, so here we go. If I was going to read this, I see this is between 30 and 40, but these little lines here are ones. In other words, this is 31, 32, 33, 34, etc. So I probably would read this one as 32.6, and that's my uncertain digit. All right, let's look at this one. This is 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Okay, so this is 33.6, or maybe 7. Again, I'm estimating. Now, it appears from the example I gave on the last slide in these first two that everything is one place after the decimal. That's not always true. Just keep that in mind. Read one place more than the instrument is marked. Okay, here's another one. 8 to 9. So now, this is 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5. So this one I would call 8.47. Again, you hear me questioning my last guess because it is a guess. There's an 8 right there, and the point 4 is also clearly marked. That's right there. That's very certain. We should not disagree on the 8.4. The 7 is up for grabs, meaning I thought it was maybe 7. Some of you might have said 8.46. 8.4 isn't good enough, nor is 8.5. So you do have to have, in this case, two places after the decimal. And let's look at this last one, which isn't really marked at all. Let's say it's right, let's say it's right on this line here, this line right there. This one I'll make harder because since it's on a line, this is 11 and this is 12. So this is 11.50, because right on the line. And then this last one with length, we do the same way as we do with these volume readings. I know it's at least 5 and it goes from 5 to 6. So that line is 5.1. Now actually, the dotted line looks a tiny bit to the right of the marking, at least to my old eye. So I'm going to say it's 5.11. And that's how you'd read that one. I hope you got these. You'll have more practice in class, but please feel free to ask if you don't understand. Now, in measurement, of course, we want to be as accurate and precise as possible, because that will 
translate into better data and perhaps a better conclusion. We don't want to have errors in our conclusion of an experiment because we couldn't read an instrument correctly. So that's why it's important to read instruments. And we want our data to be accurate and precise. right? Accuracy and precision, if you look it up, depending on what your native language is, you might, if you type it into a translator, actually in some languages, accuracy and precision mean the same thing, but they actually do not. Accuracy means how close your value comes to the true value. And I'm going to put quotes around true value because as a scientist, sometimes we don't know what the true value is. But hopefully being accurate means if, I, if something is supposed to weigh 8 kilograms and I use a scale, it's weighing 8 kilograms. That would be accurate. Um, your, if you take a, your temperature with a thermometer and you get 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit um, and your thermometer is reading 98.6 and you don't have a fever, that would be an accurate thermometer. Precision is a little bit different. Precision is um, how close a series of numbers are to each other. It's really repeatability. So let's say I take my temperature of 98.6 and I don't have a, a fever. So I, I notice that and that's good. But let's say I take it again one minute later with that thermometer and I'm getting 98.2. And then I take it again another minute and it's 99.5. Something's wrong with the thermometer, assuming I'm not ill, of course. Um, so the precision means can we do the experiment over and over again and get the same data? We want our instruments to have precision because that would be that would say something about the instrument. As a scientist, you might not know if your instruments are working properly, so if you take a series of measurements with an unprecise um, measuring tool, you could have some serious problems. And you might think you're accurate when you're not. So accuracy and precision are both important when you are taking measurements. Scientific notation. You, I'm sure, are used to seeing this from a, maybe a math class, and it's a way to represent really small or really large numbers. It's composed of a number, pardon me, between 1 and 9, and an exponent in base 10. So it might look so, something like 3.5 times 10 to the 7th. If we wanted to write that in standard notation, that of course means you move the decimal point 7 places to the right. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, seven. That's the actual number, 35 million, and it's um, essentially a 35 with six zeros. So the seven indicates we're moving seven places to the right because it's a positive exponent. Negative exponents, of course, move to the left. Here's your calculator, or an example of a calculator. I happen to have mine here. Mine's at 83 plus. The one I'm showing you there is an 84 plus. I found this on the internet so that you could see it more clearly. Now, I'm going to show you how to use your calculator to do scientific notation. There is absolutely no reason why you have to do any of these calculations in your head. In fact, I encourage you to use the friendly calculator. I also often call it the magic of math. Um, in fact, my dream is to have a calculator, like a scanner in a grocery store, that I could just wave over my math problem and it would calculate it for me. I'm still working on that. So, in any case, here's a calculator. Yours might look like the TI-84+. plus. It really doesn't matter. You, If you have a scientific calculator, which are much less expensive than these, um, I'm happy to show you how to use those. But most people have this kind, so I thought I would talk about this one. So I'm going to do some calculations in my calculator, and then you can try it in your calculator and see if you're getting the right thing. Um, and we'll do it in class again. So if for some reason it's not working for you, please bring your calculator in. If you do have a, a, just a scientific calculator, um, which, by the way, this summer I saw on sale at Staples for $10, um, they work perfectly well. I love them, and I'm happy to show you how to use those, too. 
So back to this calculator. So let's say we want to do some scientific notation on it. And I'm going to put some really crazy numbers out just to practice. So let's say we have the number 4.96 times 10 to the 18th power. And we want to uh, multiply that by 3.1 times 10 to the uh, negative 7th. Now your book will go into great detail about how to, you know, multiply the first part and if it's greater than 10 what you do and you subtract exponents or add exponents and, and so forth, how you work the, the um, multiplication and division of a scientific notation, but we're going to use a calculator. So here we go. Let me show you how to add it in. You're going to type in 4.96, which is obviously this number here, so 4.96. Then comes this part, and this is the part uh, people forget, so don't forget this. Your calculator is built with this button right here. Do you see the EE -E button? You want to access that button because the, uh, it, it, t it tells it it's going to be in scientific notation. To get there, we put the second comma and then the exponent. So I've got my maybe. I've got 4.96, that's what I've typed in. Then I put my second button, oops, and my comma, those are supposed to look like buttons and not kind of failing, second comma, and on the screen it's actually, I don't know if you can see mine, it looks like an E there, and that's what yours will look like. So you typed in second comma to get to that, it'll say E even though it says EE -E on here. E, and then you type the exponent, in this case 18. See that? You don't put 4.96 times 10e. No, no. There's no 10 in there. For over $100 in this beautiful calculator, you got the function of the exponent. So all you have to do is put in the exponent. So 4.96 second comma 18. That I've entered that number. Then times, because of course I want to do some multiplication, 3.1. And then we want this again, so second comma, this time, second comma, and now we need negative 7. The negative is actually down here by the enter button. So that's what it looks like in my calculator. So, second comma, negative, that's another little button, 7. And then I'm going to push my enter button, <laughs> hang on. I didn't put the multiplication sign. All right, I'm going to go back. Now, I'm going mm, to I'm going to just type it all again. It happens to all of us. 4.96 times 10 to the 18th power times mm -hmm, 3.1 times 10 to the negative 7. Now, I'm going to verify. I think when I showed it to you before, some of you probably said, hey, I forgot the multiplication sign. I just didn't hear you. Okay, 4.96 e18 times 3.1 e negative 7. Hopefully you see that. Okay, I'm push enter now. Phew, a number comes up. This is what it says on my calculator. 1.5376 e12. That's what it says on my calculator. But of course, as a scientist, I'm going to figure out how to report that correctly, which I will show you in a minute. And um, what? why does it have an E there? Normally we don't write numbers with E, but in this case I'd probably report this as 1.5 times 10 to the 12th power. So even though my calculator says this, this is what I actually write down. Because it's embarrassing to have an E in a number. Nobody has that. last thing I think we're going to talk about in this particular um, video is percent error. Sometimes we make mistakes. It happens, like the last time when I couldn't use my own calculator. Errors happen. Sometimes there is a true value, and we're not hitting that true value, whatever it is. And we want to figure out, okay, how far are we off from the true value? Like if we're trying to find the boiling point of water, the, the accepted value for the boiling point of water at standard pressure is 100 degrees Celsius. 
But let's say we're making, a, you know, we use a thermometer and we continue to get the wrong thing. It's probably the thermometer, but nonetheless, we want to figure out our percent error. We would use this formula. The experimental value minus the accepted value, well, absolute value, divided by the accepted value times 100. So the experimental value that we got, this is what you get in lab, versus accepted value, which might be um, something that you get from a book or another resource, an accepted value. Um, so in my little example, let's say we were doing the boiling point of water, and I kept getting 97. And this is pretty easy because there's a 100 and the boiling point of water is 100, but we'll do it anyway. So the percent error is the absolute value of 97 minus 100 over 100 times 100. Well, you can see the numerator, the number is 3, and of course these cancel mathematically. That rarely happens in percent error because usually the accepted value for things is not 100, and we have about 3% error. Not too great, but not too shabby either. So that's how we calculate percent error. Here's another example of percent error. Let's see if you can get this one. And again, you might want to stop the video, try it, and see what I get. So the student measures the density of an unknown to be 1.25 grams per milliliter. The accepted value for the density of the substance is 1.33. What's the percent error? Well, the unknown that they got was 1.25 minus 1.33 over 1.33 times 100. Now, again, we're not going to get the exciting uh, idea of the denominator canceling with that 100, but that's all right. We do have our calculator. And I got about 6% error, approximately. So that's how you figure out your percent error in an experiment. We will be doing a lab later in this unit that will involve um, your calculation of percent error. You will actually be doing something like this. You'll be finding the density, and um, uh, you'll compare it to the known densities. And hopefully, your percent error is close to zero.